Actually gonna do a Vagar video right after this. Do a Vagar video. Do a Vagar video. So Vagar, who's the ride Vagar, but because the Vagar section and Vagar, Vagar. Look, I'm I'm sorry. Okay, I'm I didn't mean to cause so much controversy with my last video. I just thought, hey, if George wanted us to pronounce it Vagar, then he would have spelt it like Rhaegar. But since he didn't, I figured it must be Vagar or Vagar, and I thought. Vagar sounded cooler. However, I yield, I yield, I have heard the outcry, and in fact, someone has informed me that George does indeed say Vagar. I usually try to go with the pronunciations that George gives, so that's how we'll say it. Vagar. I mean, I'd, I didn't mean to stir the pot. I'd, I'm not trying to start a six Blackfire Rebellion over here or anything, so. With that said, let's talk about Vagar, Queen of Destruction. Although Beleriand, the Black Dread, is probably known as the most mighty and terrible dragon in the history of House Targaryen, and rightfully so, I think Vagar might actually be the dragon who has killed the most people in the history of Westeros. We're not here to take anything away from Beleriand, of course. He did melt the largest castle ever built in Westeros in a single night, leaving Harrenhal's five towers looking like five twisted fingers of black misshapen stone grasping for the sky, or like melted black candles with each tower more grotesque and misshapen than the last, lumpy and runnelled and cracked. Megor the Cruel also used Beleriand to burn the Sept of Remembrance with, uh, check's notes, uh, oh yes, all of the warrior sons and other devout members of the faith locked inside. They don't call him Magor the Cruel for nothing, folks. But here's the thing, Beleriand being much older than Vagar, remember Beleriand actually was born in Valeria before the Doom. Beleriand actually dies in 94 AC, at which time he was already very sluggish and had not been used in combat in many, many years since Magor's death. Vagar, however, kept right on burning things long after Beleriand's death, right up to and definitely through the Dance of the Dragons Targaryen Civil War of 129 and 130 AC that will comprise the main events of House of the Dragon. That's 132 years of destroying things in Westeros for Vagar, that hoary old bitch as she's called by none other than Jaceres Valerion. So ladies and gentlemen, feast your eyes on arguably the most destructive, murderous dragon in the history of the Seven Kingdoms. Thanks to 2021, a Song of Ice and Fire calendar artist, Sam Hogg, who got George to finally describe Vagar's appearance, we now know that the coloring of Vagar is bronze with greenish blue highlights and that she has bright green eyes, as you can see in this art that Sam did for the calendar. By the time of the dance, Vagar is 182 years old and is by far the largest and most terrible dragon, having equaled Beleriand in size. And from everything we've heard, House of the Dragon is actually going to go all out in portraying Vagar as truly massive, with jaws so big a horse could ride down her gullet just as Tyrion Lannister describes in the books. Vagar is actually going to be ridden by not one, but two characters during the course of House of the Dragon, the first of which is Lena Valerion, who was the daughter of Corlys Valerion and Rhaenys Targaryen, the wife of Daemon Targaryen, and with Daemon, the mother of Bela and Rhaena Targaryen, who will also be on the show. Lena is played by Savannah Stane, who we've already seen in costume, and she's going to be a very important character in season one. She's also going to look quite fabulous atop Vagar, the largest dragon of House of the Dragon. And I'll just remind you that it's actually quite common to see women, or even very young teens, what you'd still call children really, riding even the biggest dragons like Vagar. And of course, Danny rides her dragons when she's about 15 or 16, but her dragons are also very small. So the point is, you don't have to be Magor the Cruel to claim an already huge dragon. The dragon bond is magic, so it's, it's just not about physical size. In fact, after Lena's untimely death in 120 AC, which is, by the way, a tragic year in which several important season one characters will die, Vagar will actually be claimed by a 10-year-old that being Aemond One-Eye Targaryen, the second-born son of King Viserys and Queen Alicent. By the time that war breaks out nine years later, Aemond One-Eye will have grown into a 19-year-old and a major player in the action. And his possession of Vagar for the Greens 
will serve as a constant check on the plans of the Blacks, who begin with several more dragons than the Greens. So essentially everything that Damon and Rhaenyra and Corlys might think to do, they have to first account for Vagar. So they think about doing this or doing that. So they have, like I said, a dragon advantage, and they think about attacking King's Landing. But they don't, because they're like, oh, that's right, they have Vagar. And in the end, they only attack King's Landing after Vagar is safely occupied elsewhere. So that's the first thing to know about Vagar on House of the Dragon, is that her shadow looms so large that she shapes the strategy of both sides throughout the entire war. As we mentioned last time, Aemond One-Eye will be played by The Last Kingdom's Ewan Mitchell, who, as you can see... Looks like a fantastic casting. Aemond will become Daemon's chief rival and bitter enemy. And given that they possess arguably the two meanest battle dragons, Caraxes and Vagar, it's only a matter of time before Daemon and Aemond and their dragons are at each other's throats. So just how destructive is Vagar, queen of destruction? Well, let's play some of the hints. I don't want to die. We'll start with the 60 or so years that Vagar is ridden by, of course, Queen Visenya the Conqueror. Vagar was hatched on Dragonstone in 52 BC, that's before conquest, and that's 23 years before Visenya was born. At the end of the video, I'll actually have a theory about who may have ridden Vagar before Visenya, so stay tuned for that. Now, Visenya, of course, begins using Vagar to destroy things in earnest during the conquest, which actually begins in 2 BC, since the conquest is officially dated from Aegon's coronation in Old Town at the end of the war, which lasts about a year and a half to two years. So after sending ravens to all the great houses of Westeros to declare their intention to rule a unified kingdom, Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya set up shop on the spot that would eventually become King's Landing. And then they set out to use their dragons to convince people that this whole One Kingdom thing is, you know, a good idea that they should probably go along with. Rosby, which as you can see on the map is pretty close to King's Landing, yields to Rainies without a fight. But a few foolish crossbowmen at Stokeworth loose arrows at Visenya until, quote, Vagar's flames set the roofs of the castle keep ablaze, forcing their submission. And thus begin the deeds of Vagar, Queen of Destruction. So after the three conquerors defeat the combined forces of Lord Darklyn of Duskendale and Lord Mouton of Maidenpool, Visenya decides not to allow Duskendale to be sacked, so Vagar doesn't get to burn any cities that time. But they do take all the gold, and that's something they couldn't have done without the dragons. Next comes Visenya's conquest of the Eyrie. So the Arryn fleet, augmented by Bravosi warships, actually defeats the Targaryen fleet, sinking a third of its ships and capturing another third. Now ordinarily this would have been the end of the battle, and perhaps the end of the Targaryen attempt at conquest altogether. But the men of the Vale, of course, had no answer for dragons. And Visenya was able to turn the tide of that battle with Vagar alone, burning so much of the Arryn fleet that they were forced to submit. After this, Visenya makes a tour of nearby Cracklaw Point, which must have heard how it goes when you try to resist the Targaryens. And so the very wise men of Cracklaw, which would include Nimbledick's ancestor, of course, and them smart Cracklaw men, they offered up their oath of fealty to Visenya and House Targaryen without a fight. That's because we, we're good, loyal dragon men round Cracklaw. Okay, I'll sorry, I'll put my Nimbledick voice away now. So next comes the infamous Field of Fire, where the conquerors bring together all three dragons for the only time during the conquest, in order to burn about 4,000 or so Reachmen and Westermen, including all the nobility of House Gardener, some of the nobility of Casterly Rock, and the dragons also leave tens of thousands more with burn injuries, all while losing only 100 men for the side of House Targaryen. After accepting the submission of another wise soul, Torrin Stark, who realized the uh, futility of opposing dragons, the three conquerors then split up again, with Visenya returning to the Vale to finish her conquest. Now, I'd like to tell you that she melted every way castle on the way to the Eyrie to slag or whatever, but Visenya simply flew her dragon over all these newly fortified castles and just landed in the inner courtyard of the Eyrie. Famously, the boy heir of the Eyrie, Ronal Arryn, asked his mother to go flying with the lady, and Visenya did indeed ensure the submission of the Vale of Arryn 
by giving the boy prince a ride on Vagar. Afterward, collecting the three crowns of the Vale Kings from his probably somewhat slightly terrified mother, Cher Aaron, Queen Regent of the Vale. Just imagine your Cher Aaron. You hear the sound of leathern wings. You run out to the courtyard and Visenya's already dismounted. She's next to your young son who's like, yeah, I want to ride on the dragon. And you're like, oh, okay, I see. I, this is over, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. It's already over. And I just want to make the point that even though Vagar doesn't destroy anything here, when people choose to submit to Visenya upon the mere sight of Vagar, they are choosing submission in lieu of Vagar's flames. So these really should be counted as Vagar's victories. And I guess we can call her Vagar Queen of Intimidation as well as Queen of Destruction. This same scenario then played out on the nearby three sisters who tried to declare independence after the veil submitted to House Targaryen. Instead, Vagar shows up in the skies over Sisterton backed by a fleet of Manderley and Stark warships that were visible on the horizon, and the wiser residents of Sisterton thought about it for a second and decided to depose the current lord. And the new lord, their cousin, submitted to Visenya and Vagar without a fight. Now, after the conquest proper, the Targaryen siblings continued to war with Dorne, which is not a part of the realm. There are many battles, of course, but they're not really described in detail until about 8 AC, when the Targaryens respond to Dornish attacks on settlements along Cape Wrath. And by respond, I mean that Visenya flew Vagar down to Dorne and burned the major Dornish castles of Sandstone, Vaith, and the Hellholt. Visenya even took Vagar down to Starfall, and I guess consider this your dragon trivia for this episode, and brought fire and blood, quote unquote, to the trusty custodians of Lightbringer, probably. So perhaps we can imagine the Pale Stone Sword Tower, which is the name of the main tower keep at Starfall, bathed in dragon fire, and wouldn't that be good symbolism? So then after the tragic death of Rhaenys and Meraxes at the Hellholt in 9 AC, Aegon and Visenya unleash draconic fury over the entirety of Dorne for the following two years, which are known as the Years of the Dragon's Wrath. Fire and Blood tells us that Every castle in Dorne was burned thrice over. As Beleriand and Vagar returned time and time again, they burned the sand to glass, they sent the Dornish scurrying to hidey holes in the deep desert, and left Dorne a blasted land, a smoking desert beset by famine, plague, and blight. So the next 30 years or so were pretty chill, as most everyone in Westeros were busy being very obedient to the new uh, dragon-riding overlords, if you will. But then in 43 AC, King Aenys dies, and Magor the Cruel, son of Visenya, claims the crown and begins a war with the Faith who opposed Magor's rule, and also with anyone else who opposed Magor's rule, which there was a few people who did. It's actually Visenya and Vagar who strike the first blows in these wars. Fire and Blood tells us that the Dowager Queen mounted Vagar and brought fire and blood to the Riverlands as once she had to Dorne. In a single night, the seats of House Blaintree, House Terrick, House Deddings, House Leicester, and House Wayne were set aflame. Five castles in one night. I'm thinking that's essentially got to be the, like, Stephen Curry three-point shooting record of Westeros, right? So Visenya and her son Magor, who, of course, was flying Beleriand, were essentially burning their way through the Westerlands. And they would have burned Old Town to the ground as well. And Visenya actually wanted to make it, quote, another Harrenhal. But it seems that the uh, wiser residents of Old Town pondered the matter and decided that the uh, current High Septon, who was very anti Magor the Cruel, should suffer a tragic accident overnight. And when Magor and Visenya got to Old Town the next day, they found the gates open to them instead. After Visenya's death in 44 AC, Vagar was without a rider until Prince Balin Targaryen, Balin the Brave, claimed her in 73 AC. And by the way, that's Balon Targaryen, father of Viserys I, and Daemon Targaryen, two of the main characters from House of the Dragon. So 10 years after claiming Vagar, Prince Balin used Vagar in war, in the Fourth Dornish War, which actually only consisted of one battle, which only lasted one day. That's what happens when you match wooden ships against dragons. Vagar, along with the younger dragons Caraxes and Vermithor, 
burned the pirate and corsair fleet of the Dornish to ash, with their burning hulks looking like a hundred candles floating on the sea. Burned bodies washed up on the shores of Cape Wrath for half a year. So then 11 years later, in 94 AC, Valerion the Black Dread, the last living creature from old Valeria, passes from this mortal coil, leaving Vagar as the only dragon alive from the days of the conquest. Then seven years after that, in 101 AC, Prince Balin dies. And once again, Vagar is very sad because there are no dragon lords to fly her around to destroy things. Very, very sad. Sad dragon. That brings us to the approximate time period which House of the Dragon will begin to show us via flashback. For instance, the Great Council, which chooses Viserys I to be king, is in that same year, 101 AC. It, it's called the Great Council of 101 AC. And indeed, the council itself was spurred on by Balin's death, as Balin was the heir to the throne at that time. Now, I'm not sure how closely the show will stick to the official timeline. My guess is pretty close, with small changes as needed. But in the official Song of Ice and Fire canon, Vagar is next claimed by Lena Valerion around 104 or 105 AC. It is said of Lena that she absolutely loves to fly, and she does fly Vagar quite a bit. She and Damon actually go on a kind of Grand tour of Essos via Dragonback after their wedding, and that's something we should see on the show. So although Mighty Vagar certainly receives her share of applause and glory during this time, Lena does not destroy anything with Vagar, at least not that we hear of. Sadly. Aemond One-Eyed Targaryen, well, that's, that's another matter. And this is where Vagar's body count truly comes to rival that of Mighty Balerion. So first, Aemond almost single-handedly starts the actual war, by attacking his cousin, Lucerys Strong, after Aemond and Lucerys have just left Storm's End, where they were competing for the alliance of Lord Bormund Baratheon. In the driving rain, Vagar crushes the neck of the much smaller dragon, Arax, whose severed head washes ashore days later, along with the corpse of Lucerys. Vagar and Aemond are next involved in a three-way dragon fight with Vagar and Sunfire taking on Melis, the Red Queen. And of course, it is only the mighty Vagar who emerges more or less unharmed from that fight. Later on in the war, after a few twists and turns, Aemond One-Eye takes Vagar to the Riverlands to wage, quote, a one-man war of revenge. So 87 years after Visenya Targaryen used Vagar to burn five Riverlander castles in one night, Aemond Targaryen spends several weeks trying to outdo her. It was war as Aegon the Conqueror and his sisters had once waged it, fought with dragon flame as Vagar descended from the autumn sky again and again to lay waste to the lands and villages and castles of the Riverlords. First up was the castle of House Derry, which Vagar destroyed in a firestorm, killing everyone who didn't hide in the vaults below the earth, including Lord Derry and his heir, who were burnt to death on the battlements. Then it was Lord Haraway's town left smoking. Then Lord's Mill, Black's Buckle, Buckle, Claypool, and uh, shout out to Les Claypool, apparently. Swinford, Spiderwood. It says that Vagar's fury fell on each in turn until half the Riverlands seemed ablaze. And later we get reports of armies marching through the Riverlands, and it's basically, yeah, just a smoking wasteland of burnt trees, burnt fields, etc. Continuing the narrative from Fire and Blood, it says that Prince Aemond had become the terror of the Trident, descending from the sky to rain fire and death upon the Riverlands, then vanishing, only to strike again the next day, fifty leagues away. Vagar's flames reduced Old Willow and White Willow to ash, and Hog Hall to blackened stone. At Marydown Dell, thirty men and three hundred sheep died by dragon flame. The Kinslayer then returned unexpectedly to Harrenhal, where he burned every wooden structure in the castle. Six knights and two score men at arms, which means forty, by the way, perished trying to slay his dragon. So the lords of the Riverlands are now essentially living in terror, quite, quite understandably. And Aemond begins ranging as far as the Vale and the Crownlands. Other castles coming to know the touch of Vagar's flames include those at Stonyhead, in the foothills of the Mountains of the Moon, Sweet Willow on the Green Fork, and Sally Dance on the Red Fork. And Aemond and Vagar even burnt Bowshot Bridge, Old Ferry, and Crone's Mill, 
and even a mother house of the faith at Betchester. Well, I, for one, think this show will be trash if we don't get the burning of Bowshot Bridge and Crone's Mill. But, you know, hopefully the showrunners uh, won't let us down. And that brings us to the climactic dragon fight of the dance, which you've already been seeing in the artwork today. And that would be Aemon and Vagar versus Daemon and Caraxes. Obviously, this is a major event in the Dance of the Dragons, and it's one that a lot of people draw. So it really wasn't possible to make a video without showing you some of this dragon fight. And I will go into the details of this fight another time, or you can check out the Dragon Dances video where I read the entire scene and broke down its symbolism. But suffice it to say that neither man nor dragon walks away from this fight. So far as we know, Damon's body is actually never recovered. Vagar's skull, however, was actually somehow recovered from the bottom of the God's Eye Lake, which creates a very interesting mental picture of a medieval Westerosi diving recovery team using a bone saw in very low visibility lake bottom water to saw Vagar's skull off of her body. Or maybe they just used a boat and some sort of winch and just sort of trawled the lake until they found the skeleton. I I'm not sure how it was done, but one way or another, the skull was recovered and now rests in a dark chamber somewhere in the bowels of the Red Keep, alongside the skulls of Balerion, Meraxes, and all the other great Targaryen dragons. Thus was 132 years of Vagar destroying things in Westeros brought to a close. All right, so before we finish, I've got one Vagar-related bonus for you. This is a theory, like I said, about who Vagar's first rider may have been. And this isn't the kind of theory where I'm suggesting that the secret is spelled out in clandestine fashion, but rather a theory about a blank spot in history that could be filled in a sensible way. So check this out. Who was Vagar's first rider? As I mentioned, Visenya was born in 29 BC, which is 23 years after Vagar. We don't know exactly when Visenya claimed Vagar, we just know that it was before her wedding, which probably would have been sometime when she was a teenager. She was the oldest of the siblings. But even if Visenya claimed Vagar at age 10, that's still 33 years from the time of Vagar's hatching to the time when Visenya claimed her. And that really does seem like a long time for a newly hatched dragon to grow without ever having a rider. I mean, Vagar does go 30 years without a rider after Visenya dies, but a newly hatched dragon on Dragonstone, when they only have a couple of dragons, I just, 33 years is a long time to go without a rider. So I started thinking, who could it have been if there was somebody before Visenya? Well, how about Valena Valerion, the mother of Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya? She would have been born right around the right time, somewhere right around uh, Vagar's hatching. And although House Valerion is a Valerian family, they're not known as dragon riders, right? So that's maybe a problem, except that Valena Valerion was already half Targaryen, which means that her mother would have been Targaryen, uh, else she wouldn't have had the last name of Valerion. So what that means is that the Valerions and Targaryens were marrying for two generations before the conquerors were born. And Valena Valerion is therefore right around the right age to have been very young, or even, you know, born at the same time as Vagar. And since she was already half Targaryen, she would have been more than capable of riding the dragon. And the reason why I'm mentioning this and why this might be relevant is because it would be an excellent tie-in to the idea of Lena Valerion riding Vagar during the show. We could get some really interesting scene where Rhaenys, the queen who never was, turns to her daughter Lena and says, yeah, did you know the first rider of Vagar was actually a lady of House Valerion, the mother of the conquerors. And this would be, of course, a great way to highlight the historical connections between House Valerion and House Targaryen, which is a very important factor in the lead up to the dance because, of course, House Valerion is repeatedly slighted as Rhaenys and then Lena and Laenor are all passed over for various chances to become king or marry the king or marry the queen and so on and so forth. So the fact that the Valerions, you know, have married into Targaryen and that a Valerion was the mother of the conquerors, this is important background information. So you heard it here first, just in case Vagar's first rider does turn out to be Valena Valerion. That was me throwing a dart and uh, getting lucky, perhaps. So there you have it. 
Thanks for watching everyone. And if you're new to the channel, I'll just point out there's a little video on the front page, How to Mythical Astronomy. It's a little five minute tour of the channel. It'll tell you what topics are in what playlist so that way you can find what you're interested in and check out some of the back material. I have been seeing a lot of new people subscribing to the channel, so thanks guys, appreciate it. Welcome to the Myth family. And of course, I'll be bringing you lots of House of the Dragon and Fire and Blood videos leading up to the show. And then I'll be covering the show on Sundays. Soon as the show's over, I'll be going live to talk about it. So thanks for watching. Thanks for clicking the like button. Thanks for subscribing. And I'll see you real soon with another House of the Dragon video.